All right, today we're going to look at uh, powder processing and also the characterization of powders. So uh, first I wanna talk about powder processing. And so before we start, uh, I want you to think about what that means uh, and give a example of a way to characterize the physical properties uh, of a powder. So uh, some of you, we've already talked about this in the uh, lab class, so you can use that information, but see if you can come up with uh, what we mean by processing and then come up with a way of uh, characterizing it. So go ahead and pause and then come back and we will discuss. All right, so what we mean by powder processing is really quite simple. We just mean that we're trying to modify the properties of the ceramic powder. And so I put this uh, little schematic up here, basically just showing an illustration of this. So um, when we first synthesize or we receive a powder, uh, we don't necessarily know the state that it's in. So it could be that there's lots of you know large particles or agglomerates, which are just clusters of particles stuck together. And so we wanna sort of process it into a free-flowing powder um, that has the properties that we need for shaping. So it's really gonna depend on that step as well. And so with that in mind, let's kind of look at the overview uh, of this uh, of processing that we would have from sort of from the ground to the product and so uh, you know if this is an industrial process we're oftentimes starting with the raw ore um, and so that could be um, the material that we're interested in that just is uh, has uh, quite a bit of impurity in it or it could be an ore that we have to process or synthesize in some way to get our ceramic. So there's quite a bit that can happen uh, in that step, but we're gonna kind of uh, ignore that part. But what we are gonna look at is now that we have the ceramic of interest, um, the processing side. So how do we get uh, a ceramic with the properties that we need to go into the next step, which is shaping or forming? And so, with that in mind, we're shaping or forming that powder in a way that we're going to be able to center. And so this is the next thing that we're gonna talk about after uh, shaping and forming is this is what gives us the, the um, uniform uh, homogenous uh, body of a ceramic product with uh, the mechanical integrity. And so after that, there can also be some post-processing, machining, finishing that has to be done uh, to the part as well. Okay, so to uh, modify the properties of this powder, uh, again, we sometimes have very large particles um, or we have clusters that we want to break up. And so one of the biggest ways that we can, or most common ways that we can uh, get these properties better, so smaller particle size, reduce aggregates and agglomerates, um, is milling. And so the simplest type of milling that we can uh, incorporate is mechanical uh, milling. Uh, and one example of that is ball milling. So the idea here uh, is that we have a container. Uh, in the lab setting, we often just have something like a Nalgene bottle. Uh, and then we have uh, milling media. So these are the big, uh, dark circles here. These are a very, um, uh, a very hard, uh, tough ceramic, most likely, but it could be a metal um, that uh, essentially, um, as the, the, the uh, container rotates, these uh, go up the sides uh, at a given velocity and then come down and uh, interact with the powder in order to sort of crush it or eliminate uh, aggregates. And so we're basically using the, the velocity and the force as these things drop um, onto the powder to sort of crush it over and over again. And so that's a very simple way we can do it in the lab, but also industrially uh, is this mechanical milling. And so along with um, the reducing particle size and uh, uh, reducing uh, agglomerates, um, if we are, for example, in the lab, I showed this as well, if we are trying to actually uh, synthesize a powder, and so we have multiple powders that need to react, uh, this is one, milling is one way in which we can ensure a very uniform 
uh, mixing of the reactants so that they react very uniformly. So here's just an example of um, these two ceramics that end up forming spinel. Um, so if they're not very well mixed, we're not going to have very much contact. So only this sort of middle region reacts. But if they're well mixed, uh, then they'll be well reacted um, uh, during uh, calcination. So that's another reason. All right. So some of the reasons uh, you might ask yourself, you know, why are we wanting lower particle sizes? Why do we want to get ag aggregates? And so one of those reasons is that every time we do reduce particle size, what that does is it increase, uh, increases the reactivity with that extra surface area that we have. So that um, smaller and smaller particle sizes have greater reaction rates because surface diffusion is much greater than bulk diffusion. And so that speeds up the, the process. And so a lot of what uh, people try to do with ceramic powders is make them smaller and smaller so that they're more reactive uh, for um, sintering. And that's what we're going to talk about later. All right. um, so another variation of that mechanical milling. So there's a lot of different sort of combinations or variations of the simple sort of mechanical milling. So we saw the mechanical, which is a ball mill. Uh, there's also this jet milling that you see here. Um, and here, instead of interaction between those milling uh, media, those sort of spheres, what this does is basically uh, flows the powder uh, into sort of a, a chamber here uh, where there's, you know, uh, basically jets of air, so compressed air or gas, uh, that cause uh, rapid uh, sort of or very high velocities of the powder moving. And so that can cause uh, a lot more particle-particle interactions. So those particle-particle interactions are what are responsible uh, for the reducing particle size and so forth. Uh, so that's one way uh, we can do it as well. And here you kind of, in the schematic, you see that they're mentioning that there's a re uh, replaceable liners. And so anytime we talk about milling, we also have to keep in mind that ceramics are very tough, hard, strong materials. And so any media that we put in, any container that we put them in during these processes has a potential um, to be incorporated, uh, be etched away, uh, be incorporated into the material as an impurity. And so the liner is the same thing. So here it's a replaceable liner um, that we're getting rid of. Uh, media as well. Um, it's very important to, to keep that in mind. Uh, any media that you use, uh, that can end up being an impurity in the sample because you're having to mill for so long and they're, um, they will wear over time. And so that can go into the, the ceramic that you're trying to mill. Another variation, um, and again, they're all kind of similar in the way that they work, uh, but this is attrition milling. And so here we have, you can see the, the media here. Uh, in this case, it's just uh, metallic spheres, uh, but we have sort of this mixing arm and so this arm mixes and causes the, um, the uh, powder, which is in a slurry, so it's in a liquid, uh, along with the media to, to mix together. And that causes those particle-particle interactions, but also particle-media uh, interactions in these cases. All right. So I did also want to put um, a variation. Um, so this is not the same as milling. So in milling, we already have a powder and we're trying to reduce the size um, or reduce uh, clumping. So one way though, is to, when you are synthesizing the powder, um, is to try to eliminate the uh, clusters, the agglomerates, and try to eliminate the particle size. And one way we can do that is with spray drying. So this is kind of incorporated into the synthesis process. And so uh, basically what happens is that we have the powder of interest in a slurry uh, or some type of solution actually as well um, if we're synthesizing the powder. And what we do is we basically uh, have that slurry sprayed into a chamber. So there's a very fine nozzle here. Um, and what that does is it makes very uh, fine droplets of water 
or this uh, the slurry. And so in each one of those droplets, uh, you only have a very small amount of the powder. So for example, the idea is that we'd have a single um, uh, particle. So here uh, we have a kind of an illustration of that. We have one particle uh, and it's in a droplet of water or the solution. And so what that does is that when we spray this into this chamber, this chamber uh, is full of hot air uh, and basically evaporates very quickly. And so what that does is it allows the very uniform drying so that particles uh, are separate and they're not clustered together uh, and it keeps them from you know growing uh, and also if you are synthesizing if this is from solution you make very small uh, particles from solution and so that can reduce the particle size as well so this is kind of what would happen a step before milling and so forth to try to eliminate the need for those techniques so spray drying is pretty common in a number of fields uh, as well so this is one way and so here um, it's evaporating and by the time it reaches the bottom we have a dried particle that can be collected as a powder all right um, another method that sort of goes to the synthesis side of getting small particles uh, is what's known as the sol gel process. Um, and so uh, this can create, um, so we can synthesize uh, particles. Uh, they usually start out as amorphous, uh, but they end up having very high surface area. So we can end up getting very uh, small particles uh, that have a very high surface area and we can do a lot of things with the sol gel process so it's not just for making powders that's actually probably one of the least common uh, methods for it uh, but the basic idea is that we start with a solution um, and then through some type of uh, reaction we can form a gel so that can be through hydrolysis um, or it can be uh, from condensation um, but we form a gel so basically a solution gels um, so that the viscosity uh, is obviously greatly uh, reduced. Or sorry, the viscosity is greatly increased, and so there's not a lot of motion. So you've basically formed a, a, a gel or a jello. Um, and from there, uh, we can dry the material, um, and then uh, what's left can be these small particles. It can also be a lot of other things, but particles are one of the ways that we can uh, manufacture all right, so this just this schematic just shows a lot of the different options uh, that we can take, and so one of the common ways um, uh, to do this is to start with a metal alloc oxide, uh, as you see here. This is a, so this is the solution, and this is a very wa uh, water sensitive uh, uh, solution, and so what happens is it hydrolyzes. Uh, in the presence of water. So basically you add water to it and it gels. Um, so these materials tend to be uh, very expensive and um, sensitive to water. And so the hydrolysis uh, portion is basically adding water in a controlled way to get it to form the, the gel. And so here, um, at that point, um, that uh, hydrolysis process in that gel um, creates the particles as well. So we create these particles of the material of interest. So this could be silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide. Those are common materials that are used. And so these particles form in that gel. And because they're formed in this gel, they're constrained. So they're not able to, uh, to move about in this gel material. And so at that point, um, there's a lot of different options that we can do. One of them, the, the powder route, is to basically uh, precipitate those powder, uh, those particles, and then remove the uh, solution or gel portion, and we're left with very uniform particles. Um, often, so this is, uh, usually these particles um, are not in the final state that they need to be. They're in some type of um, hydroxide or intermediate. And so oftentimes these particles have to be um, centered or calcined in some way, some type of heat treatment that will get them to the proper state that they need to be in. Uh, but that's one way we can do it. We can basically get rid of the, the solution uh, left, 
leaving us with the particles and that gives us the uh, uh, what we're interested in. Um, so some of the more uh, common applications um, are actually to make uh, these uh, exo or aero gels. And so that's where we take a very similar approach. So we sort of gel this, um, but the uh, particles, those, those individual particles that we formed, um, are able to sort of come together uh, and network together. So you can kind of see that happening here. And so um, that can form a homogeneous body, but it's very, um, very porous. Right? So there's a lot of empty space here. So when we evaporate and get rid of the solution, the gel, uh, that will condense even more, but it will still form this very porous network. And so we can get um, uh, this, uh, this would be called uh, an aerogel, uh, sorry, this would be called an exogel. And then if we uh, get rid of the solution, uh, this would be an aerogel because it's got so much um, air in it. That's why we call it an aerogel. Uh, and so these are very um, uh, porous, light materials uh, that are useful for a lot of uh, thermal applications um, and high surface area applications. Um, so that's very common with the sole gel technique is to make these very high surface area, um, low density materials. Uh, we can also in some ways make dense materials. That's a little less common. Uh, you can make uh, coats, uh, coatings of uh, films uh, as well and make dense films. Uh, there's a lot and then you can also make fibers as well. So there's lots of different processing routes um, in this case but I kind of wanted to show you that it, it is a way that we could in fact make particles um, just like uh, the other ones that we've been talking about.